Welcome to Esoteric Lectures. Thank you for joining us once again. Uh, today, we'll be going over uh, the second section on our uh, series of the Codex book. Today, we'll be discussing animals and how animals relate to this book and kind of uh, how animals are being changed, mutated, and uh, being altered um, for this uh, big change that we have been discussing and that we see going on today. On our list today, uh, we'll be discussing animals, how it relates to the book, mutations. We'll also be talking about the Goetia. Uh, we'll be going into a little bit again about the Lithian Age and how it ties into uh, the animals. Second section will be, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about Gnostic movies, a uh, Lego movie, a movie called Fantastic Planet and how it relates to the uh, not how it relates to Gnostic information. And the last section for today's list will be, we'll be going into a little bit about AI uh, and we'll be moving into that. So let's go into animals. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, the first section will be discussing how animals are being mutated. And uh, also I'll be screen sharing some information pertaining to the book so that you guys can follow along. Um, so with that being said, uh, there's a lot of mutations going on with, uh, with animals, and uh, we see this specifically a lot with uh, GMO foods. As I mentioned before in our previous Hangout, that um, you know when you eat something, especially when you eat genetically modified food, it's going to genetically modify your body. And us as uh, humans, we consume animals. And so if you eat genetically modified uh, animals or animals that eat genetically modified food, you're going to be directly affected by that. Um, we see this a lot today, especially with our food and animals that we consume, especially with fast food, too. Uh, that food's really all genetically modified. Um, with that being said, Johnny, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Hello, I'm Johnny Midnight, uh, co-host of Esoteric Lectures, as always. Uh, tonight we uh, are going to uh, focus on the uh, chapter on animals uh, from the uh, 1981 book Codex Serfianios by Luigi Servini. And these animals are um, uh, exemplary or an illustration of what might uh, come and well what will come within our future um you have to understand right now we are in the early phases of changing into a new form of life we are passing from the living of the adamic age to the unliving of the lilithian age of uh, uh, lilithian age 2.0 um and and because of that we have to understand how are we going to be transformed? How are our animals going to be transformed? I'm not just talking about your cats and your dogs, but I'm talking about animals that you're going to consume, animals that you're going to hunt, animals that are actually going to help you, like uh, honeybees, things like that. We are animals ourselves but we're working together with other animals as they are working with us. Once that, that chain has been transformed and mutated, we have to understand what's going to happen now. What's going to happen in 10 years to 100 years to 200 years? The codex, as you see, that's being uh, displayed by Element X right now, is exemplary of um, possible mutations that are going to be um, occurring with our, within our environment. No. Element? Yes, I think so, yeah. I mean, what we see here is depictions of it looks to be fish and um, or, uh, various different animal life being uh, changed and mutated uh, genetically. And, um, you know, a lot of this is, uh, you know, we start, we're, we're already starting to see this. This has been going on for quite some time of genetically modifying the plant life and uh, as a result, uh, genetically modified animals. 
Um, you know, w there was a bunch of stories that have been coming out about mutated animals, one-eyed fish, and all kinds of stuff. And, um, you know, this is just another example of why we wanted to bring this book to the forefront, because, you know, we believe that this is some sort of uh, plan that they are that the archons, the demiurge, uh, they are trying to con uh, terraform this world uh, to better suit uh, what they are trying to accomplish. Right, and even if even if you are like vegan or vegetarian, you still have to interact with other animals to get the plant life in which you're uh, consuming. Uh, you have to consume something. Uh, you know, there has to be building rock blocks of protein and and vitamin and, and vitamins and minerals into your body so that you can live. So what happens when the living becomes the unliving? When uh, what was once uh, natural becomes unnatural, and how does that affect your body in this interstitial period? where we are going from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. Um, okay, a lot of listeners will say, well, isn't the age of Aquarius a, a, a positive uh, you know, turnabout? No, it won't be. The age of Aquarius is the manis manifestation of revenge by the Demiurge. And, Element, why exactly would you say that the, the Demiurge is, um, you know, uh, in, in a mode of vengeance against us? Why, why well, would that it, be? I think it ties into what we've mentioned before about what happened in 1945. And the Adamic will was something that the Demiurge was not uh, favored upon because... You know, like our series we did before about Adam's will, you know, people have, you know, they don't want curious people. They don't want people who are intelligent enough to be able to figure out, you know, and put the pieces together on what might be going on and what is the bigger picture of all of this stuff that we see with political movements, um, movements of agendas such as putting GMO food, and more importantly, the effects that uh, you know, are caused by the consumption of those foods. Um, you know, this is something that ties into a lady by the name of Charlotte Iserbet. She came out and uh, exposed a lot of what the educational system was involved in. The dumbing down of Americans and dumbing down of society in the world. Um, and she also went into how, like, uh, certain areas of the city... Uh, certain states and, and cities within those states implemented things like, um, I think it was called soft core learning or, or it was some kind of educational program that basically dumbed down the whole entire city. And as a result of that, there was a huge dramatic increase in crime and stupidity. This is all part of the agenda that the Demiurge is trying to put forth on earth so that people do not come to the realization that there's a bigger thing going on because if you find out uh and we've mentioned this many times before johnny that through knowledge you become aware and you have a better understanding because if you know what's going on then you might do something about it and they don't want people to know what's going on because then they might revolt and so the demiurge is making a push now to prevent that from happening because People, in, a, in some respects, are becoming aware of some facets of this agenda, and people are, are talking about it, and they can't have that because they're trying to uh, change the, the whole structure and prevent that uh, Adamic will and the curiosity of humans from finding out the truth. Am I on the ball there, Johnny? Well, yeah, exactly. You are. And, and there are many exploits that can be used to uh, make this transformation, like, let's say, our, our fauna, our animals. Here's an example. Kentucky Fried Chicken. They make what is called clucks. Clucks are not chicken. You're not eating a chicken. 
they're eating a genetically modified monster, a chimera, that is has you know huge uh, breasts and thighs. Uh, it's blind. It has no beak, so it can't peck its brother uh, next to it in the cages. And it has four legs. Um, this this thing is great business because it produces more product. And and I I am a capitalist. I I'm all down for it, but at the same time, at what result? Well, because you are eating something that has been um as, as as a consumer you're eating something that is not um suitable for human consumption yeah it's been injected with non-living in uh stuff like steroids right right a uh, steroid hormones additives preservatives this has been going on since around 1982 to 1983 by 1985, it was in full swing. And um, this isn't just, uh, you know, uh, nuclear radiation mutations in, in, in Three Mile Island or anything like that. This is going to be something that is happening commonplace. And you'll be able to see this day to day within your lives um you know 20 years from now and, and uh we're seeing the advent of it right now the Lil the uh lilithian age is in its advent it's in its early phases as of 2017 um per this broadcast um right but it's going to it, it's going to develop even more and more so, like we're seeing in the book, the Codex Seraphianius. Um. Exactly, and 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 you know, we're, we're, this is something that I think uh, anybody with a pair of eyes can see that the things in the food are poisonous. And then, well, I guess I should say not not everybody, because people, you know, and I'm guilty too. I like deep fast food because it's convenient, and I don't like having to make stuff, but that's no excuse. The food is poisoned, and it, you know the stuff that we consume is uh, toxic, and we need to be aware of that. As as this you know book is illustrating, you know this uh, language itself is the uh, seraphim, and the seraphim, if I'm not mistaken, Johnny, are the basically the fiery ones or the or the or the fallen. They're they're they are the uh, archons, basically, right? Uh, the, the, the seraphim are actually a choir of angels up in the Plurima. They're fine. You're, you're, you're talking about the Nephilim. The Nephilim are the fallen ones. Okay. Um, they are an offshoot, uh, uh, earth, earthbound ambassadors of, uh, the archons from the Hyle. I see. Yeah. Okay. The seraphim are fine. They're, they're, you know, you'll have Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and all them. They are seraphim. But <clears throat> you'll, um, the Nephilim, however, were in contact with the corpus or prime material reality in which we live. Well, with that being said, and speaking of archons, why don't we touch just a little bit about some of the Goetia and how it kind of relates here. Sure, absolutely. Uh, take it away. Well, the Goetia. <laughs> um, I want to just make this a point. Um, you know, we might mention the names of some of these things, but it isn't advisable to mention the names because they are high-ranking demonic entities, uh, archons. They are higher, and, and I guess you could look at it from the terms of the hierarchy. They control legions. Legions are basically the foot soldiers or the worker bees and of demons. They, the Goetia, are like the king mafia bosses of the little legionnaires, the uh, lower level demons. And so those are the bosses of these legionnaires. And so the Goetia, are, they're made up of comprised of 72 of them. It goes into books called the Lesser Key of Solomon or the Ars Goetia. Uh, mention these entities. And um, these entities are summoned by people in everywhere uh, because the way that it works is that People who are in the movie business, the film business, politics, and everywhere around the world who participate and practice demonology and demon summoning 
uh, will provide sacrifices to these things to gain powers that these demons allow or give them. Uh, when you take a look at a lot of um, specifically musicians or actors or actresses, you see a lot of this type of symbology with this with with certain Goetia that are affiliated with talents, such as um, uh, what is it, uh, Valpula, uh, the lion Goetia. I'm not sure if that's the one. Um, there's a unicorn Goetia. Johnny, what is the name of that unicorn Goetia? Do you remember? Amadusius. Yes, uh, that entity is affiliated with music. Uh, we are actually were uh, looking at an artist. Uh, I wouldn't know if I would call her that, but her, rapper. Her name, yeah, the, her name is Angel. She's Swedish, and uh, her biggest track is uh, Eat, You Know What, Smoke Weed. <laughs> right. And uh, she was depicted wearing a, looks like to be some kind of pajama suit of that entity. So these people are very well aware that summoning these things uh, provide them with the ability that they have. Now, John, why don't you go into what you know about it, uh, about the Goetia from your experiences. Okay. Uh, the Goetia were actually pleuromic entities at one time. Uh, they were basically uh, cohorts to um, what was once named Satan, okay? Satan was a uh, heavenly uh, pleuromic being that decided to abscond from the pleroma to create his own realm. The monad, or the real god, um, said, okay, you know, well, happy days, good luck, and um, he, he created his own realm. Satan became Jehovah, or Yahweh, as you know. Uh, we Gnostics refer to him as Yaldabaoth, and derogatorily call him the Demiurge, or the architect, or the designer, Demiurgos. Um, the Goetia were his, his buddies, and they are the entities that assist him. So if you want to... Since Christmas is coming at this uh, broadcast, think of the Demiurge as Santa Claus and the Archons are the elves. And we humans are the toys that they're making. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. And I apologize for if anybody's watching the screen here, me flipping back and forth. With the Google Hangouts in this page, uh, like I mentioned before, I have to vape whenever I do this because it helps me think, right? The nicotine, whatever, the poison, as we mentioned. <laughs> but um, you're exactly right. The Goetia are the higher uh, bosses in this in this um, you know spectrum here of this of, of demonology and of the archons. And um, you know, when you look at certain dates that correspond to certain events, there is a huge connection with Goetic entities um, that are summoned by people in higher positions of power because of the effects that um, uh, are that these entities provide and the things and the resources that they provide by summoning them, by providing sacrifice and things of this nature. And, you know, we could, I mean, I don't want to get too into it, but when you look at a lot of the questionable deaths that occur around Hollywood and also political fig uh, areas, uh, you can be, you know, don't be surprised because there is a huge connection there, again, with providing sacrifice to high-ranking demons such as the Goetia for the exchange of certain kind of powers and uh, abilities to... Uh, get uh, things and information. One of those entities that I'll, I, I will mention is Stolos. Stolos takes the form of an owl uh, and I think is corresponded to uh, information pertaining to space, mathematics, and um, information pertaining to those things. So next time you look at any kind of um, thing pertaining to mathematics, space, um, and, and even, you know, musicians, you know, they don't have to know or be scientists to summon these things, they all provide their own thing. Make, you know, take a look at the symbology. See if you don't see some of those symbols of the Goetia in, in those companies or maybe in some of the work that they do. Because uh, these people are very aware of this and they know how to use 
the powers that those things provide to them to get to what they need done. Um, Johnny, is there anything else that you would like to mention about that? If not, I think let's move on to talking about how it revolves around the Lilithian Age and the, I think we might have already, let's see here, we might have already touched upon the Age of Aquarius, but how do you think that the Goetia relate to the Age of Aquarius? I think... Well, look at the animals right now. I mean, if, if you see imagery of the Goetia, and anybody who's in the audience can look it up right now, they are animalistic. They are a fusion of, uh, you know, uh, storks and unicorns and lions and crocodiles. And, and they are this what I call a chimera. A chimera is a uh, fusion of uh, unliving beings sort of sm uh, smashed together like a cancer. And I, I don't mean to use the word cancer as some sort of a, you know, buzzword or a trigger word, but th they are what they are. Uh, when we were talking about uh, Amadeusius earlier, um, that entity does, uh, you know, manifest itself in the form of a unicorn. Um, as dumb as that might sound to a lot of listeners, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, you'll have um, a, a Garrus who uh, has, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful um, eagle wings. And what's happening now is they're trying to take animals which are you know stewards of this earth we use them to to we work with them we eat them they uh help us we help them but they're trying to transform them into their own image here right on earth and if you take a look at emojicons and a lot of pop culture, they use unicorn symbology. So you better be rest assured that they know what's up and that they're probably using that to pay homage to that entity mm -hmm. uh, or the rest of the Goetia. And you see, you know, it's it's quite you know crazy to see how people just fall in line with it. They have no idea really what they're involving themselves into. But we see these symbols of, of many of the Goetia in pop culture in movies and emojicons, commercials, you know, it's all, it's all tucked in there. You know, you just need to keep your eyes open and, and pay attention to it. Uh, Johnny, I have a question for you. I think that what we, what we're looking at here in this codex book of these animals, you know, you mentioned something that just kind of came to my mind there, which was, you know, they are trying to, you know, the Goetia are animals. There are mutated chimeric like animals would you say that a lot of what we're looking at here is, you know, they're trying to create their uh, animals from their own image, speaking of ter in terms of the Goetia. Do you think that's because they're trying to create more Goetia or just simply uh, like they're trying to create even more of themselves to m multiply themselves? Or do you think that they're simply just doing what they know how to do and maybe creating little legionnaires out of these animals? Uh, well, okay, I, th I, I, I do think it's a ladder, but at the same time, I'm wondering whether or not, and I'm really, my, my, my neurons are firing off by this question. I think that um, they have to, they can't live here. For some reason or another, uh, the corposa or the prime material reality in which we enjoy is not hospitable to them in their form. So they have to seed it with this type of transformation uh, as an intermediary, a go-between, a way to make the world that's living unliving so that they can one day populate it. Um, so, you know, when we're, we're talking about, we, there, there are many uh, Goetic entities that use the chicken and the wren and, and, uh, different animals you see on the screen right now. Um, but at the same time, I think to myself that this is something that is going to be uh, very much like you had said earlier, Element, like a virus, an infection into what 
we are experiencing today. And, and, and the reason that infection has to happen is because it is going to eventually uh, be the usher of um, the, the lack of will. That is the main number one motive for this this change. And uh, that also goes into the last subject for today, which uh, we'll be getting into towards the tail end of the broadcast today, which has to do with AI. And uh, I just made the connection there that, you know, it's another, it's just another form of them. You know, when you look at genetic modif uh, mutations and genetically modified organisms, if the Goetia want to, or the Legionnaires, because they're all, you know, working together, if they want to go into this reality because they're in the Heil, there is an energetic, and we've mentioned this before, there is a veil that prevents them from gaining access and wreaking havoc, you know, because you have things in the Heil. I'm sure you got dark matter and you got a whole other set of physics that would obviously not do well or mend well with our reality. So there has to be a... a you know, it's like, you know, if you're mixing uh, ingredients in a pancake, a pancake mix or cake mix, you separate the water from the dry, uh, you know, mixes, because if you put them together, it creates a whole nother uh, solution. So there has to be a separation between two elements or two worlds or two completely different realities of physics. And in order for them to mend with that and put them together, there has to be uh, something that, you know, there has to be something to... to allow that to happen, which is transcending the veil. So right. that kind well, of goes, it, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, take an astronaut. He can't live in outer space. He has to create, a, you know, an EVA suit in order for him to survive and maintain his reality and a new reality, which is of the vacuum of space. These Goetia have to do the same thing when interacting with this reality okay does that make sense absolutely absolutely and i think this is um, exactly what they're doing it uh you know they're doing that via the uh genetics yeah and they have to have the genetics to correspond with their uh set of physics and and their reality so they can uh basically wear that spacesuit in this reality and that in order for them to be able to do that genetically modify the world or terraform the world. That's why you see, in my opinion, that's why chemtrails are being sprayed with black goo. That's why the food is genetically modified so that when they finally, uh, you know, when they start to use those methods to interject themselves into the reality, things like the animals, things like the plants, the food will be set up so that they can interface with those, with those beings. Uh, with that being said, why don't we go in a little bit about uh, some of the movies relating to Gnosticism, specifically a movie I watched last night that Johnny re recommended to me, which was the Lego movie, uh, believe it or not, um, loaded with an, uh, Gnostic uh, information, and, and Johnny made it a good point, that, and I agree that, you know, if you're going to teach a kid about Gnosticism out there, and you might have a kid that you want to uh, share this information with and you don't want to kind of go into some of the more heavier topics you want to get them started i would say watch the lego movie uh johnny what do you think oh yeah the the, the lego movie is a basic you know my first gnostic movie it's it's wonderful it's entertaining it's fun to watch uh there's not too much objectionable uh content or anything like that uh it, you know, you'll, you'll you'll be able to understand the basic building blocks of uh, the hypostatic union hypothesis, um, as above, so below. Um, I haven't watched it in a while, but uh, Element, you did. What 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 is your take on the Lego Movie? I mean, you know. You know, it's a kid's movie. I'm an adult, but I tell you what, I enjoyed it. And I think that when the movie first came out, uh, you know, it was actually one of the best movies that actually ranked in terms of the box office. You know, a lot of people went and saw it because it's a, it's a good movie. It's, it's fun to watch. And you might be asking, well, that's a Lego movie. What are you talking about? No, no I'm, I'm being serious. It was a very good movie. And speaking in terms of Gnosticism, 
it's loaded with 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 information pertaining to Gnosticism. The characters in the movie, you know, let's break it down here. here you know, one of the main characters here is this builder guy, and um, a carpenter. <laughs> Get yeah, they call themselves <laughs> master builders, which I, in my, the first thing that I thought was a Masonic reference, but pertaining to Gnosticism, I saw this a different way. That you here, you have the carpenter, which is basically representing uh, Jesus, uh, you know, interjecting himself into, which is this Lego world. That's kind of our world that we live in, and you mm -hmm. obviously have the bad guy here, who is represented of uh, Jehovah, if I'm not mistaken, right, Johnny? Yeah, I, I, I would agree that with that, yeah. Yeah, and so you have Jehovah, you have Jesus' character here, uh, you know, and he was just an average guy, you know, in the movie, and, and he, you know, nobody really kind of paid attention to him, but uh, this uh, girl here, this character, comes to get him uh, because he was, uh, you know, he found this uh, special tool, um, and you'll, I won't spoil it, but he found this special tool that to stop this, uh, evil uh, super weapon that this that this guy was developing, and um, if you watch the movie, there's a very revealing scene towards the end of it, um, and it explains tremendous. Once you see that scene, if you know anything about Gnosticism, you will notice that that scene uh, captivates the whole story of of basically Jehovah being upstairs. And he's got his kid, which I think, Johnny, we, I asked this question, what is that? There's one character who plays a boy in the movie, you know, and I asked, what was his relation to, if Jehovah is the, is the father, and he's, you know, coming down in the stair, coming down, and, and the kid was playing with his dad's Lego set, or his world, uh, how that pertained, and you mentioned that it might relate to... Uh, so the Sophia character, what do you think? Yeah, it, it might be a Hagia Sophia also, whom I uh, define as the Holy Spirit. But he may be Lucifer. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm still, you know, trying to, um, you know, decide upon that. Now, the the woman that is assisting our our hero Carpenter, I I believe to be the Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. I was thinking when I was watching this movie that that might be Sophia. But, like an avatar of Sophia. Okay. Uh -huh. But at the same time, I mean, you know, you might want to ask yourself, well, was Mary Magdalene an avatar of Sophia? Um, Good point. You know, and, and that's something that I would have to research, like, you know, a lot ab yeah. ab about. I'm sure that they're all, you know, it's the same. I'm sure it's all kind of the, the same premise of, you know, the, the female Sophia character maybe just incarnating into a different version at a, at a later timeline, you know. Sure. Um, but this Lego movie, you know, check it out. If you get, even if you're an adult, it's a good movie to watch. And it, if you're studying the occult or Gnosticism, this is this movie is loaded with uh, tons of messages in it that you can follow along. And uh, I mentioned to Johnny that movies are a very important means by which they, um, you know, push this kind of information. And they've been well, yeah, I mean, it's the way we communicate with each other today. It's it's just the the number one form of uh, information transmission right now. Um, and it'll uh, eventually be usurped by YouTube if it's not being already and, uh, you know, other channels on the internet. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people will go and say, yeah, I'm going to go see a Lego movie because my kids want to. And a few of you might watch that and say to yourself, wow, you know, I never thought about this as being the structure, the the inherent structure of my reality. Now, another movie. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No. No. Go on ahead. I'm done. I was just going to mention another movie that ties into this, which another movie I watched last night was called Fantastic Planet, and uh, let me uh, pull that up because this movie uh, I made a point to Johnny, and Johnny made a point to me that this movie. It looks exactly like the book here that we're sharing with you guys today, which is the Codex 
uh, Serafinius book. If you look at the imagery of this book, it's very similar. The plants, the, the, the kind of world that they are in, um, and the storyline itself um, is very similar to the Codex book. And so basically what you have here is the blue people are the Archons. Um, they're part of the Demiurge world. And the whole movie, it's a, it's a book, movie made in the 1970s. And I think... 73, Johnny, I think. 73, I think it was released. Possible. I'll have to... I'll check that here. Um, but the... Uh, I think it was also made in... Was it... It was made in Croatia, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, no, no. Uh, it was actually a joint um, production. Uh, the producer was French. His name was René Lalou. And uh, the uh, direction team was uh, Czechos uh, Czechoslovakian. I see. Okay. And they had they had some sort of ability to uh, pass the uh, you know, iron curtain and and make this at the same time um, and and collaborate their talents. Uh, in in France, it was originally called La Planète Sauvage, and uh, also known as the Savage Planet. In America, it was released as Fantastic Planet. Fantastic Planet is not another world. It is the world we're going to experience in the Lilithian Age, where the Archons are able to cohabitate uh, freely and rule the Earth. Johnny, would you say that this is almost kind of like if you look at certain um, uh, things that have been presented, it's almost like this is a form of panspermia. What's panspermia? Panspermia is the theory that uh, life came from other places. It originated and seeds were planted. Oh, okay. Um, but I think that, you know, that's a different subject. But I think in how it relates to what we're seeing here with the Codex book, they're planting and changing. They're terraforming. I think that's the best term for it. Yeah, yeah of I would say no other better way to say it is uh, terraforming this world into their image. Uh, and, and, and the only motive that they're doing that transformation is to destroy free will. So in Fantastic Planet, no humans that are existing um, have free will. They're pets. They, they are collared. They are uh, turned into toys. And the main character one day is abandoned by his archon because she becomes sexually mature and she's just bored of him. And he, he uh, decides to free himself from his chain and he finds other free humans once then he began once he meets them he eventually gains gnosis and if you look here i just noticed this this is also if you look at this is a picture of a deer and the deer is also uh, a goetia it's this specific deer with the antlers uh, is depicted as being a goetia. Isn't that uh, fur fur or murmur? Yes, fur fur. Okay. Yeah, fur fur. And fur fur is, uh, I think, the it has to do with um, relationships and uh, things of that nature. Now, be be advised though that you know we we're still dealing with you know bad things here. But like again, if if the people who know about demonology. And they know how to summon these things. They use the powers that these things present to them to gain um, certain abilities. Uh, a movie that depicted Furfur was uh, the James Bond movie. Oh, gosh, what is it? I think it might have been Spectre. Um, either Spectre or one of those movies. You know, the James Bond series always, always has these very extravagant, um, you know, intros and if you look closely as the it's almost like a kaleidoscope uh they depict uh, a stag uh, and the stag also has to do with saturn but in terms of the goetia it is a goetia and so james bond obviously is a spy 
and you know he falls in love or, or uh, engages himself with many different women. So if the fur fur goita is involved in love, so they, a way of looking at it would be they would summon that entity to maybe get uh, a certain spy to engage or be or kind of let their guard down so that James Bond can go in and gather information. It's all tools that they use to gain certain abilities and powers. Um, is there anything else you want to bring on that, Johnny? If not, I'd like to maybe go into some of the AI. Uh, let's uh, let's go into AI. Absolutely. Oh I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, animals like fur fur, as a matter of fact, um, imagery of deer and uh, the, the yellow king with the, the antlers and stuff like that is very common right now. But, um, and I think that's, predictive programming in many ways but uh yeah uh, element uh let's go to the ai so ai what a big subject but very important johnny did you ever manage to uh, i recommended a movie for johnny to watch did you watch that movie the machine by chance if not you need to watch it it's it's really i uh, I, I, I have not admittedly okay. i have not done that yet i had not had it any time last night sorry no big deal. Uh, the So let's go into AI. AI is a huge. I mean, again, the whole premise of artificial intelligence is to get the non-living and the living to transfix that veil, to go to that other side. And as we were discussing with the Codex book, they need to genetically modify and alter the world to terraform the world so that they can... Um, you know, allow themselves a vessel to interact with the reality because of where they're at. AI is a very sophisticated form that they're doing that with. Um, one of the big things uh, of AI is that there have been many movies, as you can see here, and many games that have depicted people of various different organizations trying to figure out how to make AI uh, or consciousness specifically, the transhumanist uh, elements of AI and make robots be more human. I believe the reason for this is because they're trying again, once again, as we've mentioned, to allow these entities a vessel to interact with the reality. Now the movie I recommended to Johnny was a movie called The Machine. And this movie has to do with a guy who's working in some sort of uh, classified secret military project at which he ends up discovering the, uh, he ends up finding out how to, he makes a robot basically that has consciousness in it. And um, I'll pull it up here uh, after I let Johnny speak on this subject and I'll show you what a movie and how the movies tell you what they're doing that this gentleman referred to something called IIT, and I think it's called inter Interfacial and Intellectual, or see, I'm butchering the name, I'll have to look it up. But this thing was what basically he claimed that comprised consciousness. And if we look at possession, uh, possession is basically the form of invading the mind, it's, and, and AI is nothing more than another form of cyber sodomy invading the mind, so that these entities can possess the bodies. Um, another movie, and I'll throw this to you, uh, game, I should say, and I'll throw this to you, Johnny, on what you think about all this, is a game called um, Observer. And Observer is a video game about a police officer who is augmented. And in the game, you go and you are a cop who is investigating a murder, I think, of, of the guy's son, I'm not sure. And everybody in the city and the world is augmented. The world is dystopian-like. Um, I will pull that up right now. Observer game and the world is is all uh, augmented with this uh, intelligence this AI cyber intelligence and the people are augmented and and this is kind of why I believe they are using AI is just another vessel to allow these entities to come into the reality because as you play the video game you start running across weird ghosts and anomalies they actually call it something specific in the video game that I can't remember. But they start seeing these weird ghosts. And this gentleman here who plays the police officer, um, and this takes place in the year tw uh, 2084, um, 
basically starts seeing weird demonic type of figures as he moves through these different uh, worlds in his mind. And the, in my opinion, I think that the Archons are using artificial intelligence uh, to do this. And what we see in our world today is a whole bunch of AI, uh, a whole bunch of artificial intelligence, quantum computers, and many different um, methods of that, RFID chips, because when you look at RFID chips, it's nothing more than a, a, another example of cyber sodomy to invade the mind, to allow that uh, your body to become a portal uh, for these things to uh, come in and, and do what they want. Wow. What do you, you think, know, Johnny? Wow, I never even thought about that. Like, you know, what I was talking earlier today, it's my understanding, my suspicion that um, Goetic entities can't live here as they are. There has to be an interface. There has to be a fusion. There has to be a, as we call, a spacesuit for them, right? Exactly. So, you know, how does that happen? How how does that get uh, how does that get created? And uh, in our last ten minutes, I think that's going to be one of the topics I touch on. You know, why does this need to happen? Why does this transformation need to occur? And in many ways, I feel that it needs to occur in that kind of form so that they could uh, exist here and now in the prime material reality and um, control our lives. Because what is the main motive? We have to get rid of free will. We have to get rid of free will here. And what better way to do that than to put a, a freaking chip into somebody's body that controls their blood pressure? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, or, uh, yeah. Or, or, or your ability to breathe. You know, what if you had to pay an oxygen bill every month? <laughs> you don't want to be late for that. I think, actually, if I'm not mistaken, this, this, this game here actually kind of goes into that they actually have to pay. They have to pay... Uh, the whole video game plot is that the characters in the game or some of the characters that you interact with have to pay uh, a, a fee. And if they don't pay that fee, then they, the medication that they're using is, is part of their a as part of their augmentations. So if they can't, if they can't get their medication then their augments don't work and because their augmentations are implanted within their body, then their body shuts down. Eventually they die, right, exactly. exactly. So what's happening was what was something that was freely living with free will is no longer um, able to live freely. It, you have to pay to live. It's not pay to pay, pay to play, it's pay to live. Um, it's pay to exist. And what happens if you can't foot the bill? Well, <laughs> it's, goodbye. It's, yeah, goodbye. Um, and and what'll happen is you'll get respond. Um, but the thing is, is that you know, uh, you know, we're in 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 future episodes, we are going to actually focus on uh, each Goisha. There are seventy two of them. So I hope you're patient. I hope you like this. But we are going to. Uh, um, we we are going to uh, you know uh, analyze them um, when whenever you can whenever we can and uh, it's 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 going to be a long uh, a long series but I think it needs to be done because very few uh, YouTube contributors are doing this right now um, but first we're going to examine you know the. Uh, structure of the Codex uh, Seraphianius. Right. Yeah, it needs to be done. And uh, all of it ties in. All, all of it is tying in here. And it all has to do with, like we've mentioned before, and, you know, just keep this in mind as you, as we do this series, because the whole theme of what all this has to do with is those archons are trying to get into our reality and they need a method of means of terraforming the world, which is what they've been doing, changing the GMO, changing the food supply, altering animals, altering plants, altering people, altering uh, artificial intelligence. 
uh, showing it in the movies, getting people prepared so that they don't freak out and also preparing the world for them to come into existence uh, to transfix that veil. Um, and they're doing it by AI. They're doing it by uh, promoting augmentation. They're doing it by GMO, chemtrails, so you name it. Um, so just keep that in mind that, that that's what we're talking about here. They are trying to come into this reality and they're trying to alter the genes so that when they do, they have a method or they have a vessel to be able to possess, for lack of a better word, so that they can come into the reality. And that's a very scary thing because, you know, if you look at it, look, look at a world run by AI, which it already is, by the way, we do have a world run by AI. It's everywhere. Everything that you do, everything that you say, you look up on Google. And as we speak now, our words are going into a giant computer somewhere that is gathering data to feed into possibly robots and, and who knows what else that they are making so that when those things do come in to this reality, they have all the data that they need to, to know exactly how to, how to push the buttons. The last 10 minutes here, why don't we talk a bit about what we learned. Johnny, go ahead. Well, uh, one thing that I really learned today was the fact that, um, you know, we're, um, I, I learned about the manifestation of the motive. You know, why do the Archons um, need to do this to us? Well, it's because they need to come here. And in order to come here, they have to alter the world um, to, to suit their needs. And to suit their needs... The living, which we are right now, has to become the unliving. And I also learned that, you know, we are in the early phases of this transformation. Um, one thing I did not learn is how do we stop it or how do we arrest that process or slow it down? I don't know. I really don't know. I think the best thing right now for myself is to learn how to survive as long as I can in this this landscape um, to to learn how to survive under this terraformation, and it is. You, and you're absolutely correct, element. This is a terraformation. They have to, you know, invade us and and make this planet habitable, uh, or or actually rather this reality habitable for them which it isn't right now but they're working on it and there are agents upon this earth uh like al gore who are working to make that happen for them right yeah i i say what i learned is the same thing you know i'm learning more and more about the method means by which they're doing this, and specifically a lot of my research has been uh, going into AI, uh, doing a lot of research into AI to, you know, figure out how they're, how fast they're moving, and they're moving very, very quickly uh, on, on this AI thing. And uh, that's one of the big things I have my attention on because it's such a complex uh, way of doing it. I think it's, you know, one of their main methods that they'll be doing it is by AI. Um, and, uh, you know, using that as a vessel to allow these entities in and uh, run run the show. Uh, you know, and I actually had a dream about it, too. I had a dream that um, this was shown to me, that they would, that the humans are the computer and they are basically being the uh, ones to gather or pr provide metadata to this big system so that it can figure out what to do and how to terraform better by means of a computer. So if you have a giant computer that tells you what to do and how to get everything set up, then, uh, you know, it's telling everybody what they need to do to get things in order. And, um, uh, you know, another movie that kind of went into this was Tron. You know, uh, Tron is like the beast Baphomet computer, uh, if you will. And, um, you know, that kind of goes into that. Well, it's something we'll have to get into at a later date, but it all ties in. It's all uh, having to do with terraforming this place to, uh, you know, provide them a, a vessel uh, to do so. Right, um, and exactly. It, it, it is a, a, a form of a vessel, uh, just like, uh, say, any kind of addiction, you know, heroin or alcohol or 
uh, marijuana or sex. You know, it's this, it's a cup that needs to be filled. Um, and they, they need to fill that cup. But in order to do that, they need to be able to interact with it. Right now, they're working on a way to do this. And like I said, there are earthly agents that for, you know, by whatever means and whatever reasons are in compact with them. And um, these entities want to come here. And we have, you know, moles, I guess you could say. Um, all over the world. Many of them are, you know, known. You read about them in the news every day. And others are are not so well known. Yeah, I think that they're using the Goetia to, I think in terms, if you want to look at it like a, a pyramid structure or a hierarchy, uh, at the very top you have the Goetia. The Goetia gives the oligarchs the information on what they need to do so that the Goetia can complete their agenda. The oligarchs basically provide by, you know, and this is why they summon these things, I think, to get that information so that they can, you know, because they're all in compact, they're trying to figure out what they need to do because the Goetia have their agenda. The oligarchs have their own agenda. And uh, I believe that the Goetia tell the oligarchs what to do. The oligarchs build the plan so that the Goetia can complete their agenda and then, you know, it just goes down the list there so that they can, uh, you know, and we get the brunt end of it. <laughs> you know, we are, uh, we are secondhand information uh, compared to what they're doing at the top. Well, uh, I mean, this, this is going to be like a topic for a, a, a much later show. But, I mean, there are some Gnostics out there that are working with them, you know. Um, you know, they, they, they want to acquire the gnosis, the knowledge, to join them. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, well, it, it, it's very interesting. And, and, and that's, uh, they exist too. So, I mean, that's something that we would have to talk about much later on after we, you know, go through, uh, you know, various topics, um, especially finishing the Codex. Well, uh, I don't really have anything else to say, Johnny. Do you want to bring up anything before? No, I, I, I think I think this is a, a, a really good show, and uh, I hope you come back uh, later, uh, anyone in the audience. And uh, I want you all to have a great midnight. Thank you for joining us, and uh, until the next time, have a good one.